Hi, welcome to Maker Fun Moments powered by Brilliant Labs. I'm Nellie, and I'm so glad you could join us today. Did you know that there's junk floating above the Earth? It's estimated that there's about 8,000 metric tons of space debris up there. That's like having about 4,000 elephants bouncing around the Earth. The more things they would hit, making more debris or junk. Hmm. Can you calculate how much one elephant weighs if 4,000 elephants are the same as 8,000 tons of space junk? If space junk hits new satellites, and if there's enough of it, it could cause cell phones to stop working, and you wouldn't even know what to wear tomorrow because space junk could take out the weather satellites, and you'd better learn how to use a map, like a paper one, because GPS, Global Positioning Satellites, you know, the maps that are on your mobile device, well, they wouldn't work either. To help make space and our Earth a better place and easier to navigate, the United Nations has created 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Let's consider goal number nine, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. This means we need responsible, safe manufacturing, good, strong buildings, bridges, and homes, and to solve problems in new ways by making with fewer resources and using sustainable and responsible innovation. Today, we're gonna learn all about space and how what happens up there affects us down here. We'll think about space junk and imagine what we could do to help clean it up. Then we'll become explorers and travel through time learning about the history of space and innovation and science. We'll learn about rays and measurements by making a constellation scope and get answers from an expert who knows a lot about space and Canada's role in it. Now let's get making. Hello Brilliant Labs viewers! Most recently I've been observing nature by going out on my back deck and looking at the stars above. Now luckily I'm positioned such that my viewing angle is west-south-west and what this allows me to do is view the constellation Orion, the hunter, rising above the horizon just enough so that I can barely see the three stars of Orion's belt. Now, I find this simplistic star formation inspiring for the mobile that we are going to build today for our Maker Fun activity. As I consider my design, I want to try to be empathetic to all components of this mobile. What if my perspective from Earth is only one of infinite different perspectives and infinite different numbers of mobiles and designs of mobiles? The issue is we are limited right now by space travel. How are we supposed to position ourselves such that we can see a new formation of Orion's belt and create a new mobile? Well, what if we could travel to a point in space and time where two of those stars that are closer to Earth, Delta and Zeta Orion, are in formation directly behind one another. You see, Epsilon is 1,975 light years away from the surface of the Earth, and Zeta and Delta are on average 700 light years away from the surface of the Earth. So how far would I actually have to travel through space and time such that I can see this new perspective of Orion's belt where these two stars stars are directly behind each other. So for this thought experiment, I thought I would design a little model not to scale of our own solar system. Here's the Sun and Mercury and Venus and Earth and Mars, and you're going to see that I ran out of room to draw all of the planets, and that includes our forgotten about dwarf planet Pluto. Even this, even though this illustration of our solar system is not to scale, it's going to help us figure out just how far away different reference points are from this star system of Orion that we were talking about. For instance, did you know that the distance between the Sun and our forgotten friendly planet of Pluto, the dwarf planet, is 4.8 billion kilometers? Now, we've been talking about something called the light year, or a light year, and the distance between Earth and the two stars in Orion's belt that we're interested in, Zeta and uh, Delta, is 700 light years. What that means is you would have to travel at the speed of light for 700 years just to be in the vicinity of this star system to understand this new perspective. 
perspective is particularly difficult when we're talking about distances that if one square of this paper was 4.8 billion light years, I would actually need 78 of these sheets of paper lined up side by side to even begin to draw a scaled model of our solar system, let alone a light year or 700 light years away. So that leads me to think, let's say that space travel to Orion's belt is possible so that I can see this star cluster and form a new mobile. So let's say that we have this incredible intergalactic garage of which is occupied by four space vessels, two of which are fictitious and two of which are very real. The Falcon uh, Heavy from SpaceX and NASA's uh, Space Shuttle that did many missions back in the 80s. You can see here that those two very real ships only travel at a speed of 40,000 kilometers per hour. I say only, but that is still very fast, but nothing compared to the fictitious vessels that we see below them, the Enterprise D at a warp factor of 9.9, .9, and if you believe what Han, Han Solo says to be true, the Millennium Falcon at 25 light years per day. That is fast. The great thing about being a maker is that we can engage in these thought experiments even though they are very hypothetical. Well, the idea about space travel to a star system 700 light years away is hypothetical. These experiments, though, of thought, they bring about these questions that are very important, such as how significant are our actions here on the planet Earth? And what if a change of perspective 700 light years away or even one light year away or even a kilometer away from our community. What if a change of perspective is really what we need to consider our actions in our community? Well, bonne nuit, stay brilliant, et soyez creative.
The space is filled with science, math, and stories. Check this out. The early examples of aerospace engineering dates back to the 1480s. A man by the name of Leonardo da Vinci observes birds flying and begins to build flying machines. These inventions operated by simple machines, pulleys, levers, gears, and were meant to mimic how a bird would flap his wings. Although they never took off, it marks the beginning of aerospace engineering and innovation. Fast forward a hundred years in the, and we arrive in the Netherlands, where Hans Liebershey and Zacharias Janssen, two optical device makers, have competing patterns for the telescope. Galileo hears about the telescope. Within days, he has designed improvement, increasing magnification 20 times, and points it to the sky, revealing details of the universe that had not been previously known. Fast forward another few hundred years. In the early 1800s, Sir George Cayley, thought of as the father of aeronautics, fascinated with flight, discovers the four aerodynamic forces of flight, lift, drag, thrust, and weight, and becomes the first person to fly a glider. The 1800s are marked with many significant moments. With the Sikorsky rocket equation, the first photograph of the moon, and observations of other galaxies, the addition of steam power on gliders, Sikorsky proposing the space elevator, Otto Lichtenfeld was experimenting with 2,500 gliders, and his first scientific institution created by Edward Sabin, an electromagnetic observatory at the University of Germany. All these events led to the Wright brothers. In 1903, invent, build, and fly the world's first successful motor-operated airplane. The first successful power flight in Canada was the Silver Dart, flown by the Canadian Aerial Experiment Association out of Bedeck, Nova Scotia. Exploring the history of space science was a lot of fun. Now let's consider today and the future of space innovation by talking with an expert about space and Canada's role in it. Hi, Isabel, welcome to Maker Fun. Thanks for calling, Grace. I recently learned that the Canadian Space Agency was created more than 30 years ago to help Canadian innovation and exploration. My papa showed me a picture of the Canada arm. He said it was a robotic arm that was used to support astronauts during their spacewalks. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. It helped the uh, astronauts during their spacewalks and did so many other things uh, like maintaining the space station. Uh, capturing cargo vehicles, um, uh, fixing satellites uh, like the Hubble Space Telescope. What was your favorite subject in school? Oh, I really loved um, art and uh, everything that was uh, science and math. But I must say that if there would have been a subject about the future, that would have been my favorite subject. I was fascinated by the future, but also technologies of the future. And I thought that they looked uh, like magic. They were so advanced. And uh, I was reading science fiction a lot. And art allowed me to imagine the future and draw what I imagined uh, would be the future. 
and uh, and studying uh, math and science um, allowed me to understand a little bit of uh, how science, how the technology works. Uh, I, I really like to understand how things work and to solve problems uh, that I really liked. What kinds of drawings did you draw as a kid? Oh, I was drawing future spacecraft. Uh, I really loved space exploration from a very young age. So I would draw um, uh, rockets, uh, spaceships, satellites, very complicated satellites with lots of instruments and features. Um, I was also simulating spacecraft, so building in the basement some some spacecraft and imagining that I was on a mission and I would travel to space. Uh, but I would draw uh, what I imagined my future could be as well. And I dreamed about becoming um, an aerospace engineer. I dreamed about uh, contributing to space exploration from a very young age, because for me, that was um, a projection uh, in the future. I thought space exploration was, uh, was the future. And that's why, uh, um, I, and, and that's what I would draw and imagine. What's the future of Canada in space? Oh, it's so exciting. Uh, so exciting for your generation, actually. So if space is something that you'd like to work on, uh, it's, it's really, really exciting to look forward. Uh, for example, Canada announced uh, recently, uh, just a bit uh, more than a year ago, a couple of years ago, that we would participate to moon exploration. So uh, we will build the Canada R3 for a station that will, uh, a smaller station than the International Space Station that will orbit the moon. Uh, so it will be a uh, an intelligent arm. It will use artificial intelligence and be more sophisticated and more autonomous. So we will do this. So we're, we're just starting to build Canard on 3. Uh, and uh, we will also uh, contribute other technologies for moon exploration. So this is very exciting. And the moon is really a stepping stone. Uh, it's just a step on the way to exploring Mars. So the next, uh, the next destination will be planet Mars, and we hope that humans uh, will uh, soon travel to Mars. Soon, I mean, soon is maybe uh, around 2030, 2040, uh, something like that. So uh, just in time for, for you actually to uh, be part of it. <laughs> what is your role at the CSA? I'm the director for astronauts, life sciences and space medicine. Uh, what that means is that I'm responsible for Canada's participation to human space flight missions, so astronaut missions, and also uh, utilization by Canada of the International Space Station to do research. And we focus uh, on health research, which is very useful um, to, um, uh, because the knowledge we acquire in space um, um, when we try to understand the effects of the space uh, environment on human health is applicable on Earth. So we get to better understand health uh, that is useful for everybody. Um, I would say also that this is something that was always important for me was to have an impact. So I described the Mars mission before. So for me, studying Mars was a way to better understand the Earth as well. So comparing the two planets, maybe we could better understand how our planet uh, can evolve. Uh, we can better protect it. We know that climate change and, and our planet is evolving and I wanted to, to understand that. So I thought it was very useful. Uh, working on the telescope, helping scientists to understand how the world works. Uh, when we acquire new knowledge, then we can find new solutions and new applications. Um, so this is for me something um, very important. And now that uh, I'm uh, responsible for uh, health research on the International Space Station, then I can see how um, how we can create benefits for everyone. Uh, for example, if we understand better the effects of inactivity, if uh, because astronauts in space, they, they don't uh, work a lot. They don't work uh, with their bodies because they're floating. Uh, this, this affects uh, our physical condition and uh, understanding that understanding that better can help us also uh, do the right thing on earth to stay healthy uh, exercise 
and uh, and also uh, solve some uh, health issues. When are humans going to Mars? That's a very long trip. Uh, just going to Mars one way can take between six months uh, to a year. Um, so if we go one way, let's say one year, and then we stay on the surface and we come back another year, it's a two to three year trip, uh, round trip to go to Mars. Very, very long. And it's important uh, before we endeavor in such a long trip to understand uh, what are the effects on human health. That's Sending humans is, is at the heart of the challenge, at the heart of the problem is how can we keep humans healthy uh, physically, psychologically, socially on such a long trip? How can we reduce the risks and make sure that the mission will be successful? <laughs> it sounds like you have a lot of problems to solve. Thanks, Isabel, and happy innovating. Thank you, Grace. It was a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. I hope you had fun making today. I know I did. What was your favorite part? Did you make along with us? We want to see your Maker Fun project. Share it with us. Visit us at brilliantlabs.ca to learn how. Stay brilliant, and we'll see you next time. Hmm. Can you calculate how much one elephant weighs if 4,000 elephants are the same as 8,000 tons of space junk? Hi there, Maker Friends. Do you remember that we had a math question at the beginning of the show? And that question was, how much does one elephant weigh if 4,000 elephants are the same as or equal to 8,000 tons of space junk? To solve this math Problem, we're going to use division and check our work with multiplication. So the cool thing is, is that when we have numbers such as 4,000 and 8,000, we can actually simplify them down to four to eight. So now we have an easier way to do our math. So again, we want to know how many times does four go into eight? Well, I do know that one times four is four. And then if we go eight minus four, we are left with four. So how many times does four go into four? Once. And one plus one equals two. So we have to be careful because the question was dealing with thousands. So if we know that four goes into eight, two times, or eight divided by four equals two, we have to remember to go back and add our zeros. So that means that an elephant weighs as much as 2,000 tons. That, my friends, is a pretty big elephant. Thanks so much for joining us for a wonderful episode, and we look forward to doing more math problems with you. Thank you.